So we're going to be in the Gospel of Luke this morning, Luke 19. You can certainly turn there in your analog Bible, which is this, or your digital Bible, which is this, which, by the way, I just want to throw this out there. It's okay if you guys have your phones out in church. I'm not your grandma. If you want to take pictures or if you want to get online and join the feed and start talking with people and be like, yo, shout outs from the room, that's fine. You guys can, okay, you guys are looking at me like it's not fine. I'm telling you, it's okay. You can have your phones out. Just don't be doing the Uber Eats and waiting for me to finish so that you can have lunch. That's the deal. If you do get on the chat, if you do want to say hi to the chat, to the live feed, just keep your volume down on your phone because then there causes feedback and then the streams cross and then the marshmallow man's going to come and eat everybody. That's a throwback to the 80s. Anybody? We got to preach. All right. So we're in Luke chapter 19. And this is the story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree to see what he could see. That's the same Zacchaeus. We're going to not just look at the Sunday school version or the song version of Zacchaeus, but we're going to look at the biblical version of Zacchaeus, and we're going to try to get everything that we can out of this story. We are in our summer series called Bible Stories. We're picking these stories. Most of them are famous, and we're diving in just like Grandma's Fried Chicken, trying to get all the meat off the bone. So here we are, Luke 19, verse 1. Before I start, am I okay? Are you guys okay? We're fine? All right. Would you lie to me? All right, well, let's get into the word. Luke 19, 1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So Zacchaeus ran on ahead climbed up into a sycamore tree to see Jesus, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up to him and said, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Verse 6, so Zacchaeus hurried, came down, and received Jesus joyfully. And when they saw it, when the crowd saw it, they grumbled. He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Verse 9, And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. What a fantastic story that is interesting far beyond a short guy climbing a tree. Though that's something to behold, there's a lot of really excellent things happening in this story. And in fact, we're going to look at 12 lessons that we can pull from this story. And I literally saw half of you go, huh? Can he get through 12? We're going to get through 12, I promise. But there are 12 stories, or sorry, 12 lessons, 12 insights, 12 things that we can pull from this story if we'll just start at the top and work our way all the way to the end. And the first story, the biggest part of this story, perhaps the major theme, is that nobody is beyond salvation. Why does that make sense in this story? It makes sense in knowing not just who Zacchaeus is, but what Zacchaeus was. It is very clear that Zacchaeus was a tax collector, but he wasn't just a tax collector. He was one of the chief tax collectors, and he wasn't just a chief tax collector. He was also very rich. How does a chief tax collector get very rich. The honest, quick answer is corruption. Zacchaeus was a corrupt person, hated by the people in Jericho. By the way, we don't know a whole lot about Jericho. 
We know Old Testament Jericho, that when Joshua led Israel into the promised land, that was the first place that they started. It had high walls, and they marched around the walls, and they were able to watch God knock the walls down, and that was the first city conquered. That was the tithe to the Lord. The rest of the promised land was given. But in the New Testament, we don't know a whole lot about Jericho. There's only three times in the New Testament where that city is mentioned, and Jesus is involved in all of them. One is in the story of the Good Samaritan. The guy is traveling to Jericho, and then he gets robbed. That doesn't really have a lot to do with Jericho. Next is we have some beggars from Jericho that Jesus ministers to, and now we have a corrupt rich man. So the only people that we know of that live in Jericho are the extremely poor and the extremely wealthy. In the context of culture, who were these tax collectors? They worked for Rome. Rome, the empire, had conquered Israel, and now God's people were subjects to the Roman Empire. And the way that the empire stayed rich is by taxing these conquered lands. Who collected the taxes? Tax collectors. See how that works? Collect. What do you do? I collect taxes. So what's your title? Tax collector. Ah, yes. Okay. But here's the thing. There wasn't any rules or laws in place on how much money the tax collector could gather. As long as he sent all he was supposed to send back to Rome, who's to say how much he can or could collect? So typically, tax collectors would collect more money than was required, give Rome what was Rome's, and pocket the rest. What made this particularly heinous is that Most of the time, these tax collectors weren't shipped in from Rome. They were local. So Zacchaeus was a Jew that worked for the invaders and robbed his brothers. This is Zacchaeus. And we see from the rest of the story, he got rich by defrauding people. He absolutely lied. He absolutely collected more than he needed to. So in a very real sense, Zacchaeus is the focal point of corruption in Jericho. If you want to know what's going wrong in the town of Jericho, look at Zacchaeus. He's a traitor. He's a Benedict Arnold. He's turned on his brothers. He's turned on his faith. He's working for these invaders, and he's getting rich, essentially, as a war profiteer, because if these invaders hadn't come and conquered us, he wouldn't have this job. He's getting rich on the back of God's people. This is Zacchaeus. And this is who Jesus came to see. When he lands in Jericho, he doesn't go to all of the poor people. He doesn't go to the sick people. He doesn't go to the church he go, or the synagogue. He goes to Zacchaeus' house, specifically calls him out. He's not just looking for, hey, who's the chief tax collector? He wants Zacchaeus, calls him by name. Zacchaeus, hurry up. I'm having lunch at your house. See, nobody is too far beyond God's reach. Nobody is beyond salvation. I wonder how many of us can think of people or have interacted with people who we would say was too far gone to be saved. They were too lost in their sin. They were too lost in an ideology. They were too lost in a lifestyle. They were just too lost for God to ever reach them. Perhaps this is you. Perhaps online, I'm catching you, and in the first couple of minutes, I've got this to say to you. You think you are too far gone. But the theme of this story is no one is beyond salvation. If Zacchaeus, the corrupt, thieving tax collector, can be saved, anyone can be saved, including you. Number two, 
we look to Zacchaeus and we learn lesson two, we've got to be willing to do whatever it takes to get to Jesus. When Zacchaeus heard Jesus was coming to town, he wanted to see Jesus. He wanted to see the miracle worker. He wanted to see the man that some were calling Messiah. He quit doing his job for a while. He left his calculator behind and his desk behind. He left the tax office and he wanted to go see Jesus. He went where Jesus was and when he got there, he couldn't see him. There were two obstacles in the way. The first is the crowd. The crowd was too thick. The crowd was too many. And the crowd was preventing Zacchaeus from getting to Jesus. I wonder how many times we've allowed other people to keep us from getting to Jesus. Maybe somebody has told us there's no reason to continue praying in faith about the issue that we've been praying in faith over because God's not real and doesn't answer prayers. I wonder how many of us have been told not to take excited passionate and outlandish steps towards God in faith because somebody has told us reasonable people don't act that way. I wonder how many of us, to flip it, have tried to tell other people that they're not for God or that God's not for them. Church isn't for them, that they need to get themselves figured out and squared away before they could ever enter into the doors of the church. We see in this scenario, there are people standing between Zacchaeus and Jesus. And if we take a lesson from Zacchaeus, we're not going to let those people get in the way. If somebody is trying to tell you that Jesus doesn't want you, or Jesus can't move, or Jesus doesn't answer prayers, or Jesus is beyond helping somebody, I want you to know they're just trying to stand in your way and we've got to get around it. But the other obstacle that Zacchaeus had to face was his own physical limitations. He was short. Can we at least agree on that? He gets to the crowd, and if he was a seven-foot center in the NBA, he wouldn't care. He would just look over their heads. But he's short. He's exceedingly short so that he couldn't see beyond the crowd. His own physical limitations were keeping him from getting to Jesus. And again, I wonder how many of us have told the Lord, I can't start a ministry because I'm not that smart or I'm not that good at speaking. I can't do this mighty act of faith, Lord, because what will somebody think of me? I didn't get good grades in school. How could I ever preach the gospel? I don't know enough about scripture. How could I ever tell somebody that Jesus loves them? How could I ever be used for the Lord? And we are constantly telling ourselves and telling the Lord about our limitations and what he's asking us to do. I can't be useful. I can't be helpful. Don't you know how old I am? Don't you know how many responsibilities I have? Don't you know all of the times that I've failed? God, I have a limitation to be used by you, and I won't now come to you. But Zacchaeus, we can learn this lesson, as he wasn't going to let anybody, even himself, separate him from Jesus. He went to a new place. He climbed up a tree. Imagine the richest guy in town climbed a tree. Okay, I'm going to help you guys. We're going to contextualize this not 2,000 years ago, but today. A guy rolls up to the Jesus parade in a Maybach. I didn't go Rolls Royce. We're going Maybach. He drove himself. No? Okay, Rolls Royce. He drives up in a Rolls Royce wearing a $20,000 bespoke suit from London. He's got shoes that he went to Italy specifically to have a wooden mold to fit his foot and only his foot. This isn't off the rack. 
somebody killed a cow with this guy in mind. He's got the Patek Philippe. He's got diamonds. He, I mean, this guy is rich. And he shows up to see Jesus, can't see him, and thinks to himself, I'll climb that tree. That's what happened. Because Zacchaeus didn't care. Because Zacchaeus wasn't going to let something like nice clothes or a reputation keep him from getting to Jesus. Verse, or lesson three. Verse five, Jesus says, come down, hurry up. And Zacchaeus came down and he hurried and he took Jesus to his house with joy. Lesson three, when Jesus speaks, we must respond. Jesus said, come down. And Zacchaeus did, and he did it with joy. Almost always, when we have an interaction with the Lord, when we have an encounter with God, he's going to speak to us. He's going to say something to us. Sometimes it's just, you're doing great. I love you. Keep going. Sometimes there's going to be some instruction. Sometimes he's going to ask us to do something in his name. Sometimes he's going to give us the statement to go or to come. He's going to give us something to do. And if God gives us instructions, we've got to do it with joy. Imagine how this story would have gone if Zacchaeus didn't hurry up out of the tree. He said, do you know how long it took me to get up here? I just wanted to see you, hi. But he ran down the tree. He did everything in joy and moving in the joy of the Lord is how Zacchaeus got into the will of Jesus, was able to now experience the goodness of Jesus then was able to experience the salvation of Jesus and the call of Jesus to be in the house. And it started with when Jesus looked up and by name said, Zacchaeus, come down. There's a moment I believe all of us will or have heard Jesus say our name. The moment of salvation, the moment that he has called us into his own the moment that we have become aware of our need for a savior. When Jesus was on the cross, he knew you would one day live and that you one day would need the salvation he was dying for. He has called you by name, but he hasn't just called you by name the one time. Lesson four says, be ready to welcome Jesus into your heart. See, Zacchaeus wasn't simply satisfied with having seen Jesus. He wasn't simply satisfied with having lunch with Jesus. He wanted to incorporate Jesus thoroughly into his life. How do I think like Jesus? How do I please Jesus? How do I live according to Jesus' standards? In the process of this salvation of where we see Zacchaeus call Jesus Lord, we see this confession of making his life right before Christ and this statement by Christ that salvation has come to the house of Zacchaeus started whenever Jesus said, come down, Zacchaeus said, yes, I will. And from that place, Jesus led him to this process. Jesus led him into a new life. Jesus led him into salvation. If we will respond, whether it's the call to salvation or the call to simply live more according to the word of God, we will be welcoming Jesus into our hearts and watching God move in new and spectacular ways. Zacchaeus was willing to invite Jesus to change his heart. Not just his circumstances, but his heart. See, our relationship with Christ isn't about 
rules as much as it's about letting him change our heart. I wonder how many of us have spent time in prayer asking God to move our circumstances, to move our boss, to move our spouse, to move our kids, to move our politicians, to move our economy, to move something, but we haven't spent any time asking the Lord to change our hearts. Help me see things how you see them. Help me embrace peace how you embrace peace. Help me love how you would love. Help me with the strength to endure. Father, don't just move out there, but move in here. And so now we shift our attention, verse 7. And when the crowd saw it, they grumbled. He's gone in to be a guest of the man who's a sinner. I love that word grumbled. It's such a good biblical word. See, when people are happy and excited, they yell, and it's clear, and it's concise. Amen. Hallelujah. Preach it, brother. We know who said it. We know what they said. It's clear. But when people are unhappy, where'd that come from? What'd they say? Who said that? Just grumbles, just grunts. Essentially, what they were saying, Jesus has gone in to be a, a guest of a man who's a sinner. He walked past all us poor people. He walked past all of us hurt people, all of us sick people, and he went to that guy's house. That guy's a crook. That guy's a sinner. That guy has a big fancy house because he's stolen all of our money. And Jesus, the man of God, goes there? Lesson five, we've got to learn how to confront our preconceptions about others. See, the crowd hated Zacchaeus and didn't think he could or should be saved. And I wonder, in our culture today, our divided culture, our hotly fought culture, our throw knives at each other, backstab each other, grumble against each other culture, I wonder how many of us would be benefited from confronting some of our preconceptions about who can come to Christ. I wonder how many of us need to hear that somebody could have voted for Joe Biden and still go to heaven. I wonder how many of us need to hear that just because somebody is struggling through sin or identity doesn't mean that they are exempt from coming to Christ. I wonder how many of us need to hear that at the foot of the cross is more than one color. I wonder how many of us need to hear that church is not a place for everybody to be the same in any way other than they we are in Christ. One of the issues that the crowd had is they couldn't see Jesus moving because they'd already allowed offense to take root in their heart because Jesus had the audacity to speak to Zacchaeus. And they missed what Jesus was doing. They missed how Jesus was trying to do something, which I'll show you in lesson 11. I wonder how many of us have missed what God is trying to do because we've allowed offense or anger or hate to take charge 
of our decision making. If we want to see God move, if we want to see this church have influence and the gospel take over our culture, if we want to see our country full of people saying yes to Christ, we've got to start allowing more people into the club. If they watch CNN or Fox, if they are on social media or not, if they went to school or didn't, if they are different than us in any way, if they want Jesus, we've got to get out of the way and let them get there. So I will say this. The car's running. It's fine. I can be quick. This church has not ever been, nor will it ever be, a Republican church. This is God's house. This is Jesus' church. And however he builds the church is how we let him build the church. Amen. Lesson six, when we finally get away from the crowd and back to the story of Zacchaeus, we see that salvation comes after confession in the Lord. Verse eight, and Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to them, today salvation has come. Salvation always comes after the declaration of Jesus' lordship. The movement of God will always come after the declaration of Jesus' lordship. Revival will always happen after the declaration of Jesus' lordship. Healing will always come after the declaration of Jesus' lordship. Unity and bringing people and families back together. Restoration will only happen after the declaration of Jesus' lordship. Forgiveness will only come after the declaration of Jesus' lordship. There is not a place in this story or in the way that the kingdom operates when we can put God to the test with an ultimatum that says, God, if you'll bless me, I'll follow you. If you'll give me a sign, I'll follow you. If you'll, if, you'll, if you'll give me a sign and a wonder, I will now do this. The only sign that we've been given is Christ on the cross, the love, the passion of Christ on the cross to prove God's love, to prove God's calling for the world. And from that place, everything else has to be Jesus is Lord first and then salvation and blessing in the good things of living in Christ come from there. And Zacchaeus got the order right. He didn't say, Jesus, if you'll save me, if you'll save my house, Jesus, I don't know if you know this, I'm kind of a corrupt guy. If you'll save me first, I'll call you Lord. He said, no, you're Lord. And now I have to live like your Lord. In lesson seven, making Jesus Lord means giving him all that we have. Again, verse eight, he said, Lord, behold, half of my goods I'm giving away. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it. Fourfold. That was the penalty in the Old Testament law. If you stole sheep, you had to give four sheep back. Zacchaeus didn't come to Jesus with stipulations. He didn't come to Jesus with the list of things he was willing to do and not do. He didn't come to Jesus with the areas of his life that Jesus could have versus the areas of his life Jesus couldn't have. He didn't say, Jesus, you can have my Sunday mornings, but not my Saturday nights. He didn't say, Jesus, 
You can have how I treat my wife, but you can't have how I treat my kids. Zacchaeus said, Jesus, you're Lord, you're boss, you're ruler, you're over everything, you're preeminent in all areas of my life. I have to go to you first in all things, and that includes my corruption, that includes my sin, and that includes the fruit of these sins. See, making Jesus Lord means giving him all that we have. To come to Christ means being willing to give him everything. And for Zacchaeus, that was his money, and that was his corruption. Because it's very possible, after Zacchaeus gave half of his money away, and then restored four times what he stole to anybody that he stole from, that he gave himself into poverty. It's very possible that Zacchaeus went from the richest guy in town to the poorest guy in town in an instant. Because he understood that his wealth was always going to lead, his greed was always going to lead him into sin. And his corruption was always going to be a temptation for him. So for him, what he needed to do to follow Jesus was to just get rid of the wealth that was driven by his greed. I don't know what your issue is. I don't know what your thing is. I don't know what you're holding on to that Jesus can't have, but you've got to let it go. I don't know if you were hurt and were victimized and you're refusing to let that perpetrator be forgiven, but you've got to let him go, not for his sake, but for yours and for your ability to follow Christ. I don't know if it's your finances, but you've got to give them over to the Lord so he can bless them. I don't know if it's your viewpoint on people that are different than you, but you've got to let that go and realize that Jesus died for the world's sake. And then what we see in lesson eight is as Zacchaeus was following this lordship path, this doing things for Christ, we see that he followed the plan that God put in his heart in lesson eight is we've got to follow the plan that God puts on our heart. No matter how big or outlandish it may seem at the time, we've got to follow God according to the plan he's mapped out for us. Imagine what a financial planner would have said to Zacchaeus. I love where your heart's at, buddy. But let's come up with a plan here. Maybe we don't give away half of your wealth. Let's do 10%. We'll start at 10%, see how that makes you feel. And okay, you want to give fourfold back to the people that you've defrauded? Let's have an application process. Let's turn in receipts. Let's make people, let's make sure people really have been defrauded because we don't want you to just give away all your wealth, bud. Or let's do, let's do 50% over an installment plan. Let's do 50% over a 20-year loan. He says no. For me to follow Christ is to give half of my stuff away and restore four times what I stole. That's what Zacchaeus understood was his need, no matter how outlandish and ill-advised it might have seemed to anybody else. That's how he followed Jesus. What has God put in your heart? I wholeheartedly believe that everybody who has called Christ Lord, called upon the name of the Lord, is saved. And if you are saved, you are in the family of God, you are in the kingdom of God, and now you are co-opted into the purposes of God. If you call Christ Jesus your Lord, I believe that he has given you a purpose and a calling. He has placed something in your heart that only you can do, a big thing, Or maybe it seems like a small thing, but it is something that only you can do. He has given you gifts for it. He has given you calling for it. He has surrounded you with people that need it. He's given you something to do. And it's possible that you've known what this thing is for a while. It's possible you've known what this calling is for some time, but it seems too big. It seems too outlandish. It seems impossible. And so you've been putting it on the back burner, or you've been saying, well, Lord, let me get some things figured out, or you've been wanting to get some things uh, 
planned first, or you've been wanting to save up first, or you've been coming up with all of these things that seem reasonable, that seem wise, that seem like they make sense. And I'm not telling you not to be wise. What I'm telling you is if you clearly hear from the voice of the Lord on what you're supposed to do, you've got to do it. If it's too big for you to understand, how amazing is it going to be when God shows up and does it? A lesser plan won't cut it. Only what God has put in our heart will make sense. Lesson nine, we see this beautiful interaction of how faith and works move together. Faith and actions work together. This will be a whole other sermon that I'll preach out of James one day, where faith without works is like a body without a soul And what James is saying in chapter 2 there and what we see lived out in Zacchaeus right here is that our true expression of faith to God can't be simple statements only. It can't be just about what we're saying. It can't just be about the confessions that we make or the songs that we make. If we are going to live a life of faith, there is a place for belief. There's a place for statements. There's a place for words. But there also has to be a place for action. And what James says is that the deeds prove the words. I say, I love Jesus. But do I live like I love Jesus? I say that Jesus can do all things. Do I live as though I believe Jesus can do all things? all things. I say I am a person of faith, willing to pray in agreement with anyone to see God move and show up. But do I live as somebody who believes that God will show up and move? I say I want to see revival. Do I live like I'm in revival? I say, I want to see God in new ways. Am I willing to do new things? I say, I want to go deeper with the Lord. But will I discipline myself to do the deeper things? And Zacchaeus didn't just say, Jesus, you're my Lord. He didn't just say, I'll follow you. He didn't just say, you're the only way for me. He acted on it. He put hands to his words, actions to his beliefs. Faith and actions always work together. And Zacchaeus could have just confessed Jesus as Lord while keeping his ill-gotten wealth. He couldn't have been able to truly make Jesus Lord and hold on to his wealth. He couldn't have said, I follow Jesus and remain a corrupt thief no more than he could have given away his money to earn his way into heaven. Both came together hand in hand, The heart changed around Jesus, and then the hands followed. Lesson 10. We go back to the crowd. We're not Zacchaeus anymore. We're in the crowd again. Jesus, in verse 9, acknowledges. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he is also a son of Abraham. Jesus brought him in. Jesus saved him. Jesus acknowledged his place in the family, his place in the kingdom. Jesus calls him one of his own and says, this man is saved, his whole house is saved. Lesson 10, we've got to let others change in the Lord. We've got to let others grow. We've got to let others develop skills and and talents. We've got to let others expand their gifts and use their gifts. We've got to let people grow in the Lord. And I've seen this in two ways. One, I remember a young girl got saved. 
Not a young girl. She was actually a teenager, but I'm getting old. And this 17-year-old girl gets saved. She's on fire for Christ. She's telling all of her friends about Jesus. And then she says that she has a very good friend at school who said, ah, I remember whenever I got saved too, or at least whenever I thought I did. It was a really exciting two months. And then I quit, and you'll quit too. I wonder how many of us have inadvertently watched somebody see the seeds of salvation or the seeds of a movement start to take root and we wouldn't let them change into who God wants them to be. I wonder how many of us have felt the call of the Lord and we do start to develop and we do start to change and we let someone discourage us because why would God ever use someone like me? Not only must we allow others to change in the Lord, we've got to allow ourselves to change in the Lord as well. Some of you might be shocked to know this, but when I was younger, there's not really a better way to say this. Nobody liked me. Like when I was in school, I didn't know how to talk to people. I didn't know how to listen to people. I didn't have any real friends. I was constantly made fun of, and I didn't know why. I, I, Any time that I would ever speak up and say something in front of everybody, all that came out was, was blurted anger. And it's hard for me to describe to you who I was as a kid and as an early teenager. But whenever I see that angry and confused in lonely kid that allowed God to move. And that the guy that I didn't think could be trusted with friends is now trusted with the church. And the guy that couldn't articulate two thoughts without stumbling now speaks for the Lord. I'm telling you, you've got to let yourself grow and change into who God's calling you to be. Verse 11, I'll be quick. We're trying to get through 12 lessons here, I know. Love is a powerful weapon. Here's what I mean by that. I want you to again remember the context of Jericho. This is a city in corruption. The rich are getting rich and the poor are getting poorer. Zacchaeus is the symbol of this corruption. He's the thief. He is the one making everybody's life hard. He's the one stealing from everybody. The turncoat working for, for Rome. That guy. And if we think about how would we bring peace into that city? How would we end corruption in that city? If I said to you, there's a town that has a tax collector who's ripping everybody off, making the poor poorer while he's getting richer and richer, we've got to end the corruption and you're in charge. What would most of us do? Protest. Riot, violent coup. Let's get everybody together and let's go take the money from that guy. But that's not what Jesus does. And this is why the crowd couldn't see what Jesus was doing. When Jesus knew about the corruption of Jericho and Jesus wanted to solve the correction of Jericho, he didn't cause a violent march. He didn't call for a protest. He didn't call for violent arms. He called Zacchaeus out of the tree and went to his house. He went to the source of corruption, not to yell at him, not to try to vote him out of office, but to love him, to speak the good things of the kingdom to him, to show him the love of Christ manifest and when Zacchaeus was confronted with Jesus, he was confronted with his own sin, and he broke 
his own corruption, or Christ broke the corruption in him. Jesus saved the city by loving Zacchaeus. Are we seeing this? Am I making sense? We are in a cultural war. We are in a cultural war for the generations behind us. We are in a generation, we are in a cultural war for the place of the church. We are in a cultural war for who is going to listen to the word of the Lord. We are in a cultural war in many different areas. And I cannot be helped but be reminded of something else that James says in his book, which says the wrath of man will never produce the righteousness of God. The way that we see change, the way that we see corruption ended, the way that we see divides bridged, the way that we see God start to move is not with violence or with threats, but with love with speaking the good things of Christ, with speaking the good things that Christ wants for the unsaved, for being those that are living the example of Christ here on the earth, being the body of Christ connected to the head, our Savior Jesus. Zacchaeus was the source of corruption. Jesus didn't start a riot. Jesus went to the man and he loved him. How are we trying to address the corruption around us? And then our last one, lesson 12. Let us always remember that Jesus came to seek and save the lost. The last verse, verse 10, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. For those of us that know Jesus, this is a good reminder that we're being used in the Great Commission Go into all the world, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything that Christ has taught us. That's what Jesus came to do is seek and save the lost. He came to seek and save the lost first. And he's called us into that work. So the question that I ask for you is how are you contributing to that work? How is God working through you to seek and save the lost? What does it look like for you on a personal level? And what does it look like for you in the church? And finally, I would address those that don't know Jesus as Savior, who don't know him as Lord, who haven't, like Zacchaeus, recognized Jesus is Lord. I want you to know that Jesus came for you. He didn't come for everyone else. He came for everyone. But he didn't come to the exclusion of you. He didn't come for just one kind of person. He didn't come for those around you but not you or your family and not you. He didn't come just for the perfect. He came for you. And he didn't come just so that you could come to church and give your tithes. He came so he could know you, so that you could know him, so that you could be saved and forgiven and called a son or daughter. If you haven't ever called Jesus Lord the way that Zacchaeus called him Lord and the way that Zacchaeus gave his life to Jesus and the way that Zacchaeus was able to hear Jesus say, say you're saved. My prayer for you this morning or my prayer for you as you're watching this online is that you would make that statement and that confession today. At the end of service, we're going to have prayer teams that are going to come up. Not right now, but we're going to have prayer teams come up. And I will encourage you to go to those prayer teams and ask them questions about what it is to follow Jesus. And ask them to help you follow him. They'll lead you in a prayer. The prayer is not a magic formula. It's not about the words. Those words are just to express what's going on in your heart.
So we've got to move on because we've got some other things in the service that we've got to do. But don't let this moment leave you. If you're online and you feel as though you need to say yes to Jesus today, maybe you're at home by yourself, maybe you're in a hotel room, maybe you're on an airplane, or maybe somebody just sent this to you and you have no idea why. Look in the chat. There's going to be a link. Follow that link or talk to one of the hosts. and They'll help you in your process of saying yes to Jesus. But let's pray. Father, I thank you very much in the name of the Lord that you have sent Jesus. I thank you also, Father, very much that we can know you, that we can know that you are good, and that we can know that you love us. I thank you, Father, for your blessings. I thank you for leading those that need Christ into salvation and calling you Father. Father, I thank you for any seeds that you've placed in our hearts this morning, that you would help us with action steps on how to move closer to who it is that you've called us to be. Give us boldness to give ourselves the right to change. Give us, Father, direction on how to step out in bold faith. Father, help us love other people and sow love into our culture as we as the church are trying to be the salt and the light. I thank you for each person here and each person that can hear me. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.